Well, hello and good afternoon and welcome back. I understand the discussion sessions went really well and we had a lot of engagement. So thank you to everyone who took part in those. I'm now really excited to open up the early stage investigator data blitz where you will hear lightning round presentations by eight exceptional early career scientists in HEAL representing the basic translational and clinical disciplines within the initiative and um, in the overall HEAL research workforce. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this topic because early stage investigators are so important for the long-term future and HEAL is about the long-term. And I know that they've been up to tremendous work despite some significant odds. So I'll now you'll introduce each of them. Um, it is quite um, the collection of talent. Um, first, Dr. Bridget, Mueller is an assistant professor of neurology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where she completed a fellowship in headache medicine. She is presenting preliminary data from the EPICNET or early phase pain investigation clinical network, studying disparities in telehealth youth among pain patients during COVID-19 and the implications for enrollment, recruitment, and retention in EPICNET trials. The next investigator, Ellen Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein is an assistant scientist in the School of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Wisconsin and a co-PI on the Healthy Brain and Child Development Study. She will present her work summarizing and synthesizing the existing empirical and evidence-based knowledge related to recruitment and retention strategies among women with lived experience of substance use while pregnant. Dr. Carla Freire is next. Dr. Freire is a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. She is an ENT and craniofacial surgeon whose research focuses on therapies to prevent opioid-induced respiratory depression and on the role of leptin in ventilation and upper airway obstruction. Next, Dr. Michael Raleigh. Dr. Raleigh is a research assistant professor in pharmacology at the University of Minnesota and the lead early investigator on a team science effort focused on clinical evaluation of anti-opioid vaccines. He will be discussing phase one research of a vaccine targeting oxycodone and an analogous heroin vaccine that is being developed for clinical testing. Then, Dr. Juliana Navia Palais, and I apologize if I didn't get that right, Dr. Palais, is a senior postdoctoral scientist in the Department of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. She will discuss her research that demonstrates the pivotal role of cholesterol and neuropathic pain and proposes a novel therapeutic approach to reverse it. Next, Mary Kleinman is a clinical psychology doctoral student at the University of Maryland College Park. She will share the results of a qualitative phase of a HEAL project investigating peer delivered behavioral interventions to improve methadone treatment outcomes. Next, Augustine Kang. Dr. Kang is an investigator in behavioral and social sciences in the Brown University School of Public Health where he has used existing data to examine health equity and identify ways to close the equity gap and access to evidence-based care for opioid use disorder among individuals involved in the criminal justice system. And then last on our list is Dr. Laura Brandt. Dr. Brandt is an international research scholar at the Division on Substance Use Disorders at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She is working with the NIDA Clinical Trials Network, New York Node, to empirically identify and validate surrogate treatment options for opioid use disorder in a secondary data analysis project. Her goal is to establish cross-national standards for measuring opioid use disorder treatment response that are useful for researchers and acceptable to patients, clinicians, policymakers, and regulatory agencies. So I'll remind you all that this is conceived of as a blitz, meaning that all of these presentations are going to be 
quite quick, but give the broader HEAL initiative audience a sense of what you're working on and the exciting innovation and knowledge that you're bringing to the initiative. So Dr. Um, Bridget Mueller, you're first, please take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Today, I'm going to talk about disparities in telehealth utilization um, in pain patients during COVID-19. So we've talked a lot about how the COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on clinical research. Many of our in-person research visits were converted to telehealth, but there are known disparities in access to digital technologies necessary to complete a video visit that disproportionately impact minorities. We know that Black and Hispanic patients were already underrepresented in clinical res research before the pandemic. And so if we don't thoughtfully implement telehealth, we run the risk of exacerbating these existing disparities. So our objective was to determine how pain patients participating in medical visits, either in-person, video, or phone at Mount Sinai during the first wave of COVID-19. We then sought to identify the socio-demographic factors that influenced visit type. And these analyses were done during two time periods, both shutdown of ambulatory practices, which happened during March through May of 2020, and the reopening um, last spring and late summer from May through, through mid-September. We found that there were disparities in how patients with pain accessed clinical care during both shutdown and reopening periods. Specifically, we found Medicaid patients were less likely to have a video visit during shutdown compared to patients with private insurance. We also found that Black and Hispanic patients were more likely to access care using the phone compared to whites and Asians during shutdown and reopening. Black and Hispanic patients were more likely to access care using in-person visits when they became available during the reopening period compared to, again to whites and Asians. So let's talk a little bit about how this research was conducted. We identified our baseline cohort using our institutional data warehouse. We identified all patients who had an ambulatory visit with an EpicNet provider and at least one pain diagnoses during the six months before the shutdown of our, of our ambulatory practices. We then determined the visit type with any provider during those two periods. And our baseline cohort was categorized in one of four groups. Group one was any patient who had successfully completed a video visit. Group two was a patient who completed a phone visit, um, but did not complete a video visit. Group three was a, were patients who completed in-person visits only, did not engage in telehealth. And group four were patients who had uh, no visits with any provider during shutdown or reopening. So the baseline cohort we identified was quite large. Over 3,300 patients were included. The mean age was 54 years and 62% were female. Our patient population was quite diverse, so 34% were minority groups and over 40% had public forms of insurance. Patients had a median of one pain diagnosis. So how did they get their care during shutdown and reopening? A little less than 12% had video visits during shutdown and that was about the same during reopening. Um, again, for about 4.5% had a successful phone visit during shutdown and the same during reopening. In-person only was a very small percentage during shutdown, not surprisingly at 1.5%, but that really jumped up during reopening where over 20% of patients had an in-person visit. Um, about 80% of our patients had no visits during shutdown. Um, that decreased to about 60% during reopening. So how did sociodemographic factors influence care? So we found that patients with Medicaid were less likely to have a video visit compared to patients with private insurance. And we found that Black and Hispanic patients were more likely to have a telephone visit compared to whites and Asians. We found that more women connected via video or phone and more men were likely to have no contact with their providers. 
Now, during reopening, when visits became an option, Black and Hispanic patients traveled um, to have an in-person visit with their provider compared to white patients and Asian patients. Patients with Medicare and Medicaid were also more likely to have an in-person visit compared to those with private insurance. And again, Black and Hispanic patients during this reopening time period were more likely to have a, a phone visit with their provider. So in summary, um, I think this data speaks to the fact that flexibility in how we engage our patients with pain, either through telehealth or in person, may improve our ability to recruit and retain underrepresented populations in clinical research. Uh, the next phase of this work is going to use qualitative studies to understand the patient experience and identify factors like access, digital literacy, the patient provider relationship and trust that impact the heterogeneity that we saw in our telehealth uh, usage. Because right now we have data, but we don't understand is was this a preference or were these patterns um, out of necessity? I have many people to thank. Um, first and foremost, my wonderful research mentor, Dr. Robinson Papp, who directs the PAIRD project, which is focuses on pain, autonomics, and immune, immune research in diverse populations. Um, Stephen Lawrence contributed significantly to this work. And finally, I want to thank the HEAL initiative for funding a training supplement through EpicNet that enabled me to, to do this work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have Ellen Goldstein next? Yes. Hello. I'm going to start my video and share my screen. Okay. Hello, everyone. This afternoon, I would like to share findings with you from our NIH HEAL initiative, Healthy Brain and Child Development Study, Building Resilience in Children and Families. This is a planning grant for a future nationwide longitudinal birth cohort study that will investigate the effects of environmental and biological factors on early child development spanning in utero through 10 years of age. Our project led by Alexander Zagierska, myself and Florence Hilliard was to develop ways to engage and retain women with lived experience of substance use while pregnant or during, or during early motherhood. We accomplished this by summarizing and synthesizing the existing empirical and evidence-based knowledge relevant to recruitment and retention of pregnant women. Also by completing in-depth qualitative interviews as well as focus groups with women who have lived experience of substance use during pregnancy. And lastly, by conducting a pilot study to test the impact of peer support as a recruitment strategy. So our initial study was a collaborative effort among several members of the Healthy Brain and Child Development Working Group. We conducted a scoping review and a content analysis of the facilitators and barriers for recruiting and retaining pregnant women in longitudinal observational cohort, cohort studies. Out of 574 publications that screened for relevance, 38 articles met eligibility criteria. The focus was both on low and high risk pregnant and early postpartum women. And the content analysis was structured around incentives, role of clinics, direct and indirect recruitment strategies, cultural considerations, participant burden, and contacting and tracking participants. So some of our findings, the majority of abstracted data focused on recruitment practices. Some of the major recruitment facilitators included building trusting relationships with participants, um, employing diverse recruitment methods, engaging in frequent, in frequent communication, and the role of clinics was quite vital. Some essential uh, recruitment barriers included a variety of heterogene heterogeneous uh, reasons for participant refusal, such as invasive sampling, sensitive topics, inconvenience, and overall or general participant disinterest. Only 21% of the abstracted data addressed retention strategies. 
Uh, some of the major retention facilitators included flexibility with scheduling, confirming appointments, culturally sensitive practices, and home assessments, whereas some of the major retention barriers included pregnancy loss, relocation, multiple caregiver shifts, and substance use and mental health issues. So this next study solicited expert opinion via an online survey distributed to researchers and healthcare professionals and gathered perspectives from in-person meetings with a diverse and local community stakeholder advisory group. And we found that, um, well, I'll get to that, get to that in, a minute, in a minute. Major concerns and solutions for engaging pregnant persons with uh, substance use disorder in research were assessed according to the socio-ecological model. So here you see the five levels of socio-ecological influence and beginning at the bottom, at the in the individual level, unique challenges of this population may be overcome by openly discussing addiction and recovery issues. At the interpersonal level, lack of trust can be overcome by establishing trusting relationships. At the organizational level, the steady burden of joining a long-term study may be overcome by developing flexible protocols. At the community level, Eliciting stakeholder input can be helpful to better understand and address the barriers of engaging a vulnerable group in research. And at the policy level, reducing legal risk can be achieved by partnering with legal advisors and social services for assistance with negotiating the complex legal and ethical situations commonly encountered by opioid substance using pregnant persons. The final phase of the study was a pilot project of peer support engagement strategies. 38 eligible participants were randomized into contact with peer support specialist or a research coordinator group. Peer support specialists receive basic training in research methods, while research coordinators receive basic addiction and recovery content training. Participants in the peer support group had 7.2 times greater odds of being engaged at two weeks, which was at the second visit, than those in the research coordinator group. And we used the Fisher exact two-tail test uh, to determine that. So in conclusion, findings across studies point to the centrality of building relationships as a core tenant of recruitment and retention success. For example, fostering trust and confidence between researchers and participants, as well as understanding cultural norms, values, and language are all very, very crucial when building working relationships with diverse populations. And lastly, our findings suggest that peer support can improve recruitment and retention outcomes for high-risk participants, including women with substance use disorder. Thank you for your attention and please feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you have at egoldstein5 at wisp.edu. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. Next, we have Dr. Carla Freire, please take it away. So first, I would like to thank for the opportunity to present our work. And I'm going to present a little, some of our findings on the effect of intranasal lactin on opioid-induced respiratory depression and mortality. Respiratory depression is the main cause of mortality related to opioids, and obesity increases the risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression. The antidote naloxone is effective to prevent OIRD, but it also reverses analgesia and induces withdrawal. Lactin is a potential therapeutic alternative because it's a powerful respiratory stimulant. Lactin is an adipose tissue produced hormone with receptors in the central nervous system centers related to control of breathing. However, obese individuals are resistant to the, lap, to the effects of leptin at the level of the blood-brain barrier. We were able to show that intranasal, the intranasal route effectively deliver leptin to the brain. And here we can see that the mice that received intranasal leptin had higher leptin levels when, the mice, the, when compared to the mice that received the intranasal vehicle. We, we, to determine the effects of lactin on respiratory depression, we did crossover studies in three groups. Baseline, a group that received intranasal vehicle and morphine, and a group that received intranasal lactin and morphine. 
And what we can see here when we measure the number of apneas per hour is that when mice received leptin, there was a 50% reduction in the number of apneas per hour. And we also wanted to determine if leptin would interfere with the analgesia induced by morphine. And what we saw when we measured the tail flick latency is that when we compare the group in orange that received morphine in vehicle with the group that received morphine in lactin in blue, is that lactin actually augmented the analgesic effect of morphine 60 and 120 minutes after the morphine bolus. We also analyzed the survival probability, and for that, we randomized mice to receive VECO or lactin, and 30 minutes later, we administered 400 milligrams per kilogram of morphine. And what we saw was that in this Kaplan-Meier curves in blue, the group that received lactin had a greater survival probability than the curve in orange, that is the group that received intranasal VECO. We also wanted to determine if how lactin would work in a chronic use setting. And this is important because chronic opioid users have opioid habituation and require high dose of opioids for pain control. And the tolerance to analgesia is usually greater and develops faster than the tolerance to respiratory side effects. For that, we first determined the optimal dose to induce tolerance in these obese mice. And what we determined was that with the 12 milligrams per kilogram per day dose that was delivered by a subcutaneous pump, there was the development of tolerance with the tail flick test after 12 days. After that, we did, we did plasmography recordings to determine the number of apneas per hour with increasing doses and more of morphine. And we will paint this curve here on the right. And we chose the dose of 10 milligrams per hour of bolus of morphine to study the effects of lactin in different doses. And this is the dose response curve that we obtained. And interesting, interestingly, we can see that in the dose of 0 0.6 and 1.2 milligrams per kilogram of intranasal lactin, there was also a reduction in 50% from on the number of apneas per hour in this morphine tolerant mice with obesity. In conclusion, intranasal lactin may prevent opioid-related respiratory depression and laugh and deaths in acute and chronic opioid users. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Next we have Dr. Michael Rowley. Hello, just uh, trying to get set up here. Okay. All right, so welcome uh, to my talk on IND enabling studies of vaccines to treat heroin and oxycodone use disorders. And the goal of our project is to develop immunotherapies to treat opioid use disorders and bring them to the clinic. And our group has completed an investigational new drug application or IND for the oxycodone vaccine which is now in a clinical trial, and we are currently working on our IND for our heroin vaccine. Now, these vaccines are made by attaching small molecules or haptins like oxycodone or morphine connected via linker here, um, <clears throat> uh, shown and shown to the right here, to a large carrier protein such as keyhole limpet hemocyanin. After immunization, animals and humans develop antibodies uh, that circulate in the blood that target the opioid. Uh, <clears throat> If opioid is administered while antibodies are present, the antibodies bind to the drug and prevent it from entering the brain to elicit its effects. So there are three main points that I wanna leave you with regarding uh, these vaccines. First, um, both vaccines have been shown to be effective at blocking the effects of their targeted opioids in rodents. Um, second, neither of our vaccines block the effects of off-target opioids, meaning they're selective in their effects. 
And this is important because we want to ensure that pain medication is available or that complementary therapies to treat opioid use disorder or overdose uh, could still be used alongside our vaccines. And third, that our oxycodone vaccine has been shown to be safe in a uh, GLP toxicology study. So prior to the initiation of the clinical trial for the oxycodone vaccine, um, <clears throat> we wanted to determine the effect of our vaccine on oxycodone's half-life. Animals were vaccinated four times, once every two weeks with either the negative control, um, which was SKLH, uh, and shown in the open circles, or oxy-SKLH, the closed circles. After vaccination, awake rats received five milligrams per kilogram of oxycodone IV over a 10-minute infusion uh, period, and then blood was collected at various times. We found that the vaccine increased the half-life of oxycodone by around um, 40 times or uh, to about 25 hours. Next, we looked at the effect of vaccination on maintenance of oxycodone self-administration. Previously, we had demonstrated that vaccination altered the acquisition or initiation of oxycodone self-administration. However, because the vaccine is intended to treat subjects currently using oxycodone, we wanted to determine the effect of vaccination on animals that had already acquired stable drug intake. So in panel A, uh, animals were trained to self-administer 0.06 milligrams per kilogram oxycodone IV. And then after they reached that stable um, uh, self-administration, uh, they were vaccinated four times uh, throughout um, maintenance. Vaccinated animals uh, demonstrated a compensatory increase in oxycodone self-administration, uh, which was due to the infusion dose being on the descending limb of the dose response curve. And this can be more easily seen in panel B, which shows the dose reduction portion of the study. And these, demonst these data demonstrated that the vaccination um, reduces the reinforcing efficacy of oxycodone. So in this study, we wanted to de demonstrate the selective ability of our vaccines to block the targeted opioids effects while maintaining the effects of non-targeted opioids. For both studies, rats were vaccinated with either control or the heroin or oxycodone vaccine. And animals received increasing doses of heroin or oxycodone um, shown on the x-axis, um, and tested for respiratory depression here and here, um, or antinociception on the top. And, uh, th and they were tested 15 minutes after each dose was given. At the end, naloxone was given uh, to reverse the opioids effects. And the main takeaway here was that uh, vaccination was able to shift the dose response curve of either heroin or oxycodone but both vaccines uh, had little to no effect on methadone or naloxone, demonstrating that the vaccines were effective um, and they were selective. And finally, for our IND application, we needed to demonstrate safety, uh, safety of our oxycodone vaccine. Animals were vaccinated with either low or high dose of uh, the vaccine once every two weeks and their food consumption and body weights uh, were monitored throughout. We also wanted to see whether there was any toxicity due to antibody drug complexes. So animals were uh, chal challenged with high doses of oxycodone daily um, for one week, and then rats were uh, monitored for a few weeks afterwards, and that's this recovery phase, to check for any lingering toxic effects. Uh, animals were sacrificed throughout at various time points after immunization, after challenge, and after recovery, to, um, and then to look for toxicity, but uh, no toxicity was, was found. The data from these studies were used to submit an IND application for the oxycodone vaccine, and we are currently working on submitting an IND application for the heroin vaccine, which is currently going through its final development. The goal would eventually be to combine these vaccines in a clinical trial. Uh, and with that, I will wrap up. Thank you for your time. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Next, we have Dr. Juliana Navia Pales. So, hello, everyone. Uh, let me put this up. Uh, so I'm going to share with you part of our efforts in the um, in the our uh, heal project for discovery and validation of uh, targets for the treatment of chronic pain. 
And we are focusing here on the chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy or CIPN induced pain for which uh, we know currently there are not effective or safe treatments available. And we know that neuroinflammation can contribute to the development of chronic, of chronic pain by sensitization of the pain circuitry. And this neuroinflammation can be developed by immune cells as microglia in the spinal cord and by innate immune receptors as TLR4 uh, to generate this inflammatory response. These receptors are localized in cholesterol-rich uh, domains in the membrane called lipid rafts. And when uh, inflammatory receptors are localized or clustered in these lipid rafts in immune cells, we call it in inflammatory rafts. And a way of um, uh, modulating these inflammatory rafts or lipid rafts and the receptors that localize in these domains is removing cholesterol from the membrane. And we use um, a protein that is called APOA1 binding protein or A1BP to modulate these receptors and the amount of cholesterol in the cell. So first we wanted to understand what happens when we remove cholesterol from the membrane with this A1BP in a CIPN mouse model. And we observed that when we deliver this A1BP intrathecally after the allogenia has developed in the CIPN, there is a reversal, long lasting reversal of the uh, allogenia in these mice. And when we wanted to take a closer look at what was happening in the membrane of uh, microglia in the spinal cord, we observed that the CIPN induced an increase in TLR4 activation uh, measured by TLR4 dimerization and lipid wrap, enhancing this inflammatory formation. And by removing cholesterol with A1BP, we observed a reduction in both TLR4 activation and lipid wrap. And taking a closer look of uh, how this spinal microglia looked like uh, at the gene transcription level, we observed that the microglia has a signature pretty similar to what microglia looks like in neurodegenerative disease, including regulation of inflammatory genes and also a lot of uh, lipid metabolism, uh, cholesterol metabolism and lipid transport uh, gene regulation. So we wonder if these, uh, this regulation of lipid genes uh, could induce accumulation of lipid in the cytoplasm of the microglia. And indeed, what we observed is that uh, microglia from CIPN mice have increased in number and size of uh, these lipid deposits that are called lipid droplets. Oops. And when we uh, use A1BP to remove cholesterol from the membranes, we observe that there is a reduction in the number and size of these lipid droplets that is also associated with that reduction in inflammation. <laughs> So now that we uh, knew that there was a dysregulation of cholesterol metabolism and that uh, it was correlated with pain, we use a different strategy, uh, deleting or knocking down cholesterol transporters that are important for the removal of cholesterol in the cells, uh, specifically in microglia. And when we uh, delete these cholesterol uh, transporters in microglia, we observe that even at a naive state, uh, the microglia have an increase in uh, this TLR4 inflammatory uh, and an increase in the inflammatory uh, gene expression. But most importantly, we observe that these animals that lack uh, the ability to uh, efflux cholesterol from the cell in microglia, they have a lower mechanical threshold, so showing a pain behavior even at a naive state. And when we uh, induce CIPN in these mice, we observe that the allodynia uh, develops uh, quicker and it's more severe and the effect of A1BP is abolished. So this tells us that uh, cholesterol transporters are important for the nociceptive response and also for the therapeutic effect of A1BP. And finally, we wanted to understand if this uh, removal of cholesterol was being targeted to where TLR4 was in the lipid raft. And we developed an uh, A1BP protein that lacks the ability to bind to TLR4, but still can remove cholesterol from the membrane. And what we observed here in the blue line is that this uh, A1BP that cannot bind to TLR4 
no longer has a robust effect and the effect is transient in reversing the allodynia induced by the CIPN. So at the end, what we have is a mechanism by which uh, cholesterol in the membrane and in the cytoplasm induce an uh, inflammatory response that is correlated with the pain behavior and a way of removing this uh, cholesterol in the membrane and reducing the amount of cholesterol in the cell can reverse this pain behavior. And so with that, I wanted to thank you all and all the collaborators and the HEAL initiative for supporting our research. Thank you. Okay, we're doing great. Next, um, Mary Kleinman, please. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker. Um, I'm excited to be included in this early investigators event. Um, as a very early investigator. And as mentioned, I'm a clinical psychology doctoral student. And I also serve as a funded graduate research assistant on Dr. Jessica Magidson's R61 HEAL project through the behavioral research to improve medication adherence or BRIM program. And we also have a stigma supplement. And this presentation describes our preliminary findings related to the effect of substance use and methadone stigma in our study population. So as most in this audience likely know, retention and medication treatment for opioid use disorder is an important focus in the fight against the opioid crisis. And medications for opioid use disorder, such as methadone, have demonstrated efficacy in treatment of opioid use disorder. However, retention is a persistent challenge in medication programs. And these gaps in OUD care point to a serious need for improved understanding of factors that affect treatment outcomes including stigma. And this study aimed to describe the intersection of stigma related to substance use disorder and stigma related to methadone treatment. So I'm going to put the main point at the top here. Our findings suggest that substance use disorder and methadone treatment stigma operate at multiple levels among patients receiving methadone at a community-based opioid treatment program. And quantitative findings from validated stigma surveys indicate that methadone treatment and substance use disorder stigma may be um, distinct constructs. And these findings are informing ongoing work to assess how a peer recovery specialist can help shift methadone treatment and substance use disorder stigma and thus improve treatment outcomes. The study and our ongoing work take place at a community-based opioid treatment program serving low-income patients and an ethno-racially diverse population in Baltimore City. And reflective of national estimates, retention at six months post-methadone intake at this treatment site is around 50%. Our qualitative phase included interviews and focus groups with patients and staff at the methadone program, as well as peer recovery specialists who work in recovery sites across the city. And a majority of participants identified as male and Black or African American. And this analysis was part of a larger parent study aiming to solicit feedback on implementation of a peer-delivered intervention to support successful methadone outcomes. And participants were asked to describe barriers to reaching successful treatment outcomes. And as a secondary analysis, we assessed how stigma was described as a barrier to successful treatment outcomes at multiple levels. Qualitative results informed a subsequent quantitative evaluation of the relationship between substance use disorder and uh, methadone treatment stigma, assessed using respective stigma mechanism scales, administered at baseline of an ongoing pilot trial evaluating a peer-delivered intervention to support um, methadone retention. And the stigma mechanism scales include subscales of internalized stigma or negative beliefs applied to the self, enacted stigma or experience with discrimination from others, and anticipated stigma or expected discrimination from others. And these are measured using a rating scale and, are, um, and ask questions about individual internalized as well as family, 
medical provider and employer anticipated or enacted stigma. So stigma was qualitatively described at multiple levels. Um, including institutional, for example, enacted by healthcare systems and the larger community, and within social networks, for example, family level, and within the patient population itself, as well as internalized. Substance use disorder and methadone treatment stigma were described as barriers to successful treatment. Preliminary results of the stigma mechanism scales established moderate levels of stigma with highest reported in the internalized substance use disorder subscale and lowest in the internalized methadone treatment subscale. And there were significant correlations between substance use disorder and methadone treatment stigma mechanisms, specifically across enacted and anticipated subscales, but not across internalizing subscales. So these preliminary results have directed us to evaluate relationships between substance use disorder and methadone treatment stigma scales in a larger sample and measure relationships between stigma and subsequent methadone treatment outcomes, specifically retention. We're also evaluating the effect of a peer-delivered intervention on all of the levels and modalities of stigma that I just described, and this will inform further adaptation of a peer-delivered intervention to further target stigma. And there are an awful lot of people to thank for making this project possible. And importantly, um, everyone has stepped up to the plate to make this possible in the context of uh, pandemic restrictions. And I look forward to opportunities to talk with many of you further about this work um, and how it might connect with your own. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next we have Dr. Augustine Kang. Dr. Kang, please take. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of my team here, I'd just like to say that we're really happy to be presenting some of the results of uh, from our early data analysis. Uh, this sub project, uh, this sub study, uh, we examined uh, the relationship between MYUD treatment and racial disparities uh, in the Cosmo setting. So to start with some background, uh, we have to first acknowledge that health disparities exist at the intersection of correctional health and addiction medicine. Uh, we know that communities of color are disproportionately affected by incarceration and uh, these disparities also extend into OUD and the reception of OUD treatment. Uh, as we consider uh, that there is a significantly higher risk of death from overdose in the time period uh, after release uh, from prison, uh, engagement with MOUD while incarcerated is a really effective method of reducing post-release overdose mortality. Uh, however, we don't currently know if there are race and ethnicity differences in MOUD treatment and uptake. So for this study, we examined incarceration and medication records for a little over 2,000 individuals who were screened for, uh, who screened positive for OUD while incarcerated at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections uh, between January 2017 and April 2020. Uh, one important thing to note is that Rhode Island began a statewide uh, MOUD program expansion in 2016. Uh, race and ethnicity data were obtained from the Rhode Island Department of Corrections uh, and a community health organization, uh, Kodak Behavioral Healthcare. Uh, for our analysis, uh, race, we examined race and ethnicity differences uh, in MOUD uptake, for example, between those newly inducted versus those previously already on uh, MOUD, uh, as well as specific medication type. Uh, I'm going to briefly go over some of the demographics to, to give some context. Um, so we see that the mean overall age is uh, about 33 years, with about 70% of the population being male. Uh, we know that uh, Black individuals were more likely to have less than high school education uh, compared to their white counterparts uh, over on the right. We note that Latinx were more likely to be male compared to non-Latinx, uh, and were also more likely more likely to have less than high school education uh, compared to non-Latinx. 
Uh, next, we examine whether participants in our study were previously on MOUD. Uh, specifically, we looked at data prior to uh, December 2016, uh, before the state of Rhode Island began our uh, MOUD program expansion. Uh, we note that Black uh, individuals were significantly less likely to be previously on MAT compared to whites. In fact, there were zero of them on MAT prior to Rhode Island's uh, program expansion. Um, for ethnicities, we didn't find a significant difference. Next, we see MOUD induction status by race on the left, as you can see from the graph here. Um, there were significantly more black individuals who were newly inducted into MOUD uh, proportion wise uh, compared to whites. Uh, this is really great news if we were to consider the previous slide uh, and our previous finding that prior to the program expansion, there was zero of this particular demographic on MOUD. On the right, uh, we did not observe a difference between ethnicities. Uh, on this slide, I just wanted to quickly show you that there were no significant differences by medication type between race or ethnicity. So uh, the key takeaways are uh, prior to statewide MOUD program expansion, no black uh, individuals were on MAT. Uh, Rhode Island's expanded access to treatment in prisons and jails can help reduce racial disparities in terms of MOUD treatment uptake. Uh, but further research is needed to identify antecedents to potential racial uh, ethnic uh, inequities in terms of MOUD uh, uptake and access. And with that, uh, I finish my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have one more to go, last but not least, Dr. Laura Brandt. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this protocol today. I'm excited to take you on a very brief journey towards rigorously defined and clinically meaningful outcomes in opiate use disorder clinical trials. Why don't we even choose to go on this journey? Well, if you take a look at the opiate use disorder clinical trials literature, it becomes apparent that there really is no gold standard outcome measure. <clears throat> Even though abstinence is often considered a gold standard trial outcome, the definitions of abstinence vary quite a bit between different studies. For example, abstinence can be defined as opioid abstinence during the last three weeks of a treatment period or complete abstinence or periods of abstinence of different length. And this inconsistency in trial outcome definitions impedes multi-study analyses as well as the interpretability of meta-analyses for opioid use disorder. The heel fund study, CTN94, both sparked the idea of the protocol I'm presenting today and also provides the data. This study on which I'm working uh, with my wonderful colleagues and mentors, Gabriel Odom, Ray Belize, Ned Nunes, Sean Luo, and other members of the team, uh, combined trial data from three large trials of medications for opiate use disorder conducted in the clinical trials network. The lack of consistency in trial outcomes I mentioned before um, can be seen in this multi-study analysis as well. Um, each trial had different endpoints. For example, um, one used abstinence during the last week and for at least two of the previous three weeks of the third month of treatment as the endpoint. Um, and another defined the, opioid out uh, the outcome as time to relapse within 24 weeks. So how can we contribute to a more standardized and homogenous use of trial outcome definitions across trials? Well, the first step would be a standardization of computation of outcomes. This is why we aim to provide a computational solution for standardized opiate use disorder clinical trial outcome definitions. This requires formalizing treatment outcome definitions commonly used in clinical trials. And that means really sifting through all the different study protocols and manuscripts to derive the precise definition that was used in this specific trial uh, to compute the outcomes. Then translating these semantic definitions into human readable pseudocode and coding and testing the algorithms. The overall goal here is to provide an open source R package that is above all useful um, and feasible for the use in future studies. 
This is an example of human readable pseudocode for the def definition of a use week, meaning a week a participant is considered to have used opioids. The seemingly simple example shows how complicated it can be to come up with a definition that is clear and unambiguous. Even when trying to define what a week is, um, that can be really challenging because it is, is it the period from Monday to Sunday or any seven day period? And if so, when do we start counting the seven days? If we were to achieve a standardized computation of different clinical trial outcome definitions, the next step would be to make sure that they are clinically meaningful, or at least to make recommendations about outcomes which may be more meaningful than others. And one way to come up with such recommendations is exploring causal pathways between opioid use outcomes and long-term functioning outcomes uh, that patients deem important. For the second aim, we will use the harmonized data set containing around 2,500 participants with opiate use disorders uh, developed in CTN94. The question here is whether a trial outcome, such as abstinence during the last three weeks of the treatment period, but it can really be any outcome that is used in clinical trials, whether that outcome is associated with long-term improvements, for example, in quality of life or drug craving. And if a strong association um, is found, that would provide evidence um, that a trial outcome may be considered clinically meaningful. <clears throat> Given that this project has just been started and we're very much still in the development phase, we would love to hear your thoughts. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions and feedback or if you're interested in collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brandt, and thank you to all of today's early stage investigators who presented. It makes me very hopeful about HEAL to see the progress that you've made and how you've invested in our research. And um, I well, I'm, you know, because of, of the format, we can't allow for questions, but we encourage you to use the lounge feature to connect with these terrific early stage investigators and um, establish collaborations that way.